All right. Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study time together. If this is your first time joining us for uh, our Wednesday night Bible study, we've been working our way through the book of James since uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, well, actually, I think since last year sometime. Uh, but we're into chapter 4 tonight. Uh, we're picking up where we left off last week. Before we go any further, though, let's just pause and uh, ask God's blessing on our time together tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for this opportunity to meet together, uh, even if it is uh, through uh, the internet. But Lord, we thank you that it doesn't matter where we are geographically, that Lord, you are with us. And we thank you for your presence. We pray that you'd bless your word to us tonight as we take the time just to look at this passage. Lord, might it instruct our hearts, might it help us to be uh, more like you in all that we do and say. So we just ask your blessing upon our time tonight in Jesus name. Amen. As I said we're picking up where we left off uh, last week with James chapter 4 uh, verse 1. Now it might be the start of a new chapter in in your Bible but you've got to remember that when this letter was first written there were no chapter divisions there were no verse divisions. Chapter 4 actually continues right on from the discussion that we were looking at last week in chapter 3. It follows directly on from James's theme. Now in James chapter 3, the last uh, five or six verses, he has been contrasting two different kinds of spirits, two very different kinds of spirits. There is the false spirit or a wrong spirit, an earthbound spirit. There we go. This worldly perspective, a spirit, a mindset, um, attitudes, values that reflect the human nature at its core, sinful and selfish. So that was the one spirit. And then last week we looked at the contrasting spirit. A truly wise spirit is a spirit that is sourced in the wisdom and in the character of God. Christ himself being the highest example, being the perfect example of this wisdom that is from above. So James has been dealing with two very different spirits. And he also pointed out two very different outcomes resulting from these spirits. A wrong spirit results in strife, confusion, disorder and wicked behaviour. A right spirit, by contrast, we noticed last week, results ultimately in righteousness and in peace. Two very different outcomes. Now in chapter 4, James continues on with this theme. He elaborates further on the dangers of a wrong spirit and what we can do to combat it. Too often, and particularly as Christians, we focus on only or primarily on the sins of the flesh. And they're the more obvious ones. They're easier to see, easier to spot, easier to judge. But the Bible talks an awful lot about the sins of the spirit. These are more insidious. They're not always so readily apparent. But the sins of the spirit are just as dangerous and harmful, if not more so. The sins of the flesh, the things that we do that other people see, very often result from the sins of the Spirit. Think of some of the warnings of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, we're told to keep the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34 brings out uh, a, a very similar thought that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. All of these pointing out that what we do on the outside actually begins with our spirit, with, our in, with uh, what we are on the inside. Every wrong action begins with a habit of wrong thinking. 
And so what James is doing here is focusing on the core problem, which is our spirit, our heart attitude. Now in chapter one, excuse me, in chapter four, beginning in verse one, he asks the question, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Do not come even of your lusts that war in your members. Here he mentions the inner source of the wrong spirit. And uh, he goes on to say in verse 2, you lust and have not, and so you kill. And you desire to have and cannot obtain, so you fight and war. Yet you have not because you ask not. There's a lot in these two verses. So let's break it down and let's try to make some sense of it. First of all, James uses three separate words to describe a wrong spirit. It's not so readily apparent in the English translation. It just uses the words lust, lusts and desire. But in fact, they are three different words with three different meanings. In verse 1, it says, uh, he asked the question, where do wars and fightings come from among you? And he says, don't they come from your lusts that war in your member? That first word, lust, there is the word for passion or desire. It's the Greek word hedon from which we get our word hedonism, and it means pleasures, gratification. So it's talking here about a hedonistic attitude, an attitude that desires to have its appetites satisfied, gratified. God created us with uh, uh, the ability to enjoy the experiences that we have in this life. Nothing wrong with that. The problem comes when these appetites begin to dominate us and take over. There is that within the human nature that longs for pleasure, that longs to have its physical senses gratified, in its place appropriate. But when these things get out of control, when they begin to dominate our thinking and our attitudes and our behaviour towards one another, we're headed for trouble. Think about our society today the modern society in which we live. Don't we see a headlong pursuit of pleasure, of the leisure and entertainment industry, people trying to satisfy their physical lusts and uh, uh, passions and desires. We see this in our relationships with each other. We see this in the addictions that people have, getting hooked on something, trying to satisfy their, uh, uh, their passions and desires, and it leading down a wrong path. So James here identifies one of the inner sources of a wrong spirit, and that is this desire for pleasure, for, to, to, to gratify our physical uh, 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 passions and desires. All right, then the second word he uses is in verse 2. He says, you lust and have not, and so you kill. That word lust is a different word and it means to long or to yearn passionately for something. Lust, in fact, is a good translation of this word, but not necessarily with today's rather more narrow moral connotations. The word lust here is that desire for anything that is a, a, an uncontrollable desire for anything beyond uh, what you should have. So what we have here, again, is this word lust, uh, 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 describing that passion for something that we want. A covetous attitude is perhaps a good way to describe the meaning of this word. And we see it again in human nature. Just imagine for a min minute, uh, mum's been busy in the kitchen and she's been baking uh, the children's favourite uh, biscuits, chocolate chip biscuits. And the smell is wafting through the house. And the children have been smelling it all day long and waiting for that time when mum calls down and says, would anyone like some biscuits? And of course they come running into the kitchen and she hands them each a biscuit. And what does each child say when they're given one biscuit? Can I have another one? Can I have some more? And this helps to kind of illustrate what is the root problem with 
the spirit that James is talking about. It's that desire for more, that passion that is never quite fully satisfied, that's never quite fully content, always wanting more. And of course, when that gets the upper hand in our lives, it again will lead us down a harmful and destructive path. The third word used is um, in verse 2, that desire to have. And that word desire actually is the Greek word zealous. Um, and and uh, very oftentimes translated in our Bible as jealous, jealousy or being zealous, jealous. The flip sides really of the same coin, aren't they? Having a zeal for something good is positive. But having a zeal for something that is not appropriate, that is not good, that is not healthy, well, that's jealousy, isn't it, really? So we're talking about somebody here full of burning desires, an envious attitude, wanting what somebody else has, not being, um, having that, um, uh, when you see the good fortune of somebody else, not being happy about it, but wishing them harm. That's envy. So here we have three different, very different words kind of describing this wrong spirit that James has been talking about in chapter 3. And it's a, 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 a spirit that's characterized by pleasure, by greed, and ultimately by envy. Three different characteristics. Now, he goes on not only to describe what this wrong spirit is like, but he shows the outcome. Three things uh, 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 that he singles out in verse 2 that result from a wrong spirit. Uh, these are representative, but by no means is this list exhaustive. Now, first of all, we see the word kill. You lust and have not, so you kill. Talking here about murder. If you're following through on your outline, that's the first blank. Murder. Now, you might say, well, uh, I would never dream of taking another person's life but you remember in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus was teaching his disciples the Sermon of the Mount he tackled this very issue he said you've heard it said in time past that you should not kill he says but I say unto you that if you hold anger if you harbor anger in your heart towards another that you're just as guilty of the one who's committed murder so here again, Jesus himself is pointing out that our outward actions find their source in our spirit, in our heart, within a wrong attitude. And so one of the outward signs of a wrong spirit is it manifests itself with this uh, 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 attitude of anger, of, uh, uh, um, of hatred, of bitterness towards another person that ultimately results in violence and death, the murder, killing. The second thing he describes as a, an outcome of the wrong spirit is uh, the word fight or conflict, strife, division, uh, uh, personal unrest in your heart, uh, an agitation, uh, broken relationships. All of these things can be uh, 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 considered under this word conflict here. Relationships in your family, relationships with others, your relationship with God, relationship in the church, relationships within our communities. When the spirit is not right, it results in conflict, strife and division. And then the third thing he identifies is quite simply the word war. And I guess this really is the ultimate uh, manifestation of, of the human spirit or the very worst in the human spirit anyways. This selfishness, this uh, 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 greed, this covetousness, this envying and jealousies that leads to strife and division and violence and murder and killing eventually uh, results in war. Covering everything from civil unrest, terrorist activity, to civil war, to nations going to war against each other. In many respects, war is the final condemnation of, uh, of, of humanity. So we find James in these opening verses has already covered quite a lot. He's given us some descriptions of a wrong spirit, a spirit that hungers inordinately for pleasure, a greedy, selfish spirit, a spirit that is envious of others, 
And this kind of spirit leads to uh, all sorts of evil. Hatred and anger and bitterness that leads to murder and killing, to violence. Conflict that results in broken relationships and division and strife individually, personally and with others. And ultimately seen in war between nations. But not only are there these outward manifestations of a wrong spirit, but there's spiritual harm that comes from holding on to a wrong spirit. Look at verses three and four. He says, you ask and receive, or, well, ending of verse two, you have not because you ask not. And here's a comment on prayer, isn't it? All too often, the reason we don't have what uh, 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 um, is because we don't trust God enough to ask for the things that we need. God doesn't give us everything we, we want, uh, but we are told that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. And all too often, the reason we don't have the things that we need is because we don't take the time to ask God for them. Perhaps we just don't believe that God is strong enough to do what he says he will do for us. But he goes on to say, but there's another reason why sometimes you don't get uh, uh, what you want. Because you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. Verse 3. That you might consume it upon your lusts. What he's saying here is that one of the spiritual consequences of a wrong spirit is unanswered prayer. Ineffectiveness in prayer. An ineffective prayer life or indeed no prayer life at all. Because the spirit has gotten so far away from God. Psalm 66 and verse 18 tells us that if we regard iniquity in our hearts, God will not hear us. If we hold on to sin in our hearts, if we hold on to that uh, greedy, covetous, selfish, bitter, anger, angry, envying spirit, then God's not going to listen to our prayers. He's not going to answer our prayers. Why should he? He would only confirm us in a wrong spirit. So one of the results of a wrong spirit is that it, it renders our prayer life ineffective. Isaiah 59 verse 2 tells us that it's our iniquities that have come between us and our God. It's our sins that have cut us off from him so that he will not hear. A selfish, materialistic, greedy spirit that does not seek after the will of God might as, well, <laughs> might as well not pray. God's not listening. But contrast that with the kind of spirit that God honours. Rather than a selfish spirit, a selfless spirit. A spirit that's yielded in selfless service to God. A spirit that humbles himself before God, acknowledging its own weakness, its own uh, uh, frailty, and its need for God each step of the way. A spirit that hungers after righteousness. This is a spirit that God has promised to fill. So one of the results then, result, uh, uh, spiritual effects resulting from a wrong spirit is unanswered prayer. A second thing listed here is unfaithfulness to God. Verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not? That the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It's very strong language at this point. Why is James being so extreme? But what he's trying to point out here is this, that if you're someone who professes to be a Christian, if you're someone who professes to love Christ, that you just... By your testimony, you're one who uh, 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 has aligned yourself with the cause of Christ and his gospel. But then you're going back to the world and living like the world, enjoying the things of the world and uh, living in it, it, it with this wrong spirit that we find in the world. Then it's as if you are playing uh, you, an, an unfaithful, you're unfaithful in your relationship to God. And so James, trying to point out the severity of a wrong spirit, calls them adulterers and adulteresses. That the love of the world 
makes you an enmity with God. That when you, may, uh, when you have that desire within your heart uh, to, to, to love the things of the world that are in contrast, in opposition to God, that in a sense you've set yourself against him. And so here we find uh, 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 this being brought out, unfaithfulness to God. And then hostility to God. At the end of verse 4, whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. It's not that God's love for us has changed. It hasn't. God's love is as consistent and inexhaustive as he is uh, 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 the same yesterday, today and forever and as he is infinite in every way. God's love towards us does not change. What James here is describing is the attitude of the individual having an affair with the world, if you will. That individual has changed. That individual's love for God has changed. A spirit that sets itself against God and all that God represents and his values and his ways is acting like an enemy opposed to God. And so here we find three things that result from a wrong spirit. Unanswered prayer. You end up becoming unfaithful to God. In fact, whether you realize it or not, you're slowly slipping into a place where you are actually hostile to God and to his ways. So James here paints a very dark, a very solemn, a very stark picture of the wrong spirit. I don't, think, I don't think he's over-exaggerating for a minute. I think the problem with us is that all too often we don't appreciate just how bad a wrong spirit can be. Just how harmful it is. So what's the solution for this? What can we do about it? This brings us to verses 5 and 6. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Verse 5 is one of the more difficult verses in all the Bible to understand. People have been writing about it, uh, theologians and Bible scholars since the beginning, uh, 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 since these words were first penned. And we're not exactly sure how to read this verse. It can be read in two different ways. It all depends on how you understand the word spirit. Is that spirit talking about the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit? Should it have a capital S? Or is it talking about our spirit, the spirit, the human spirit, that uh, human nature that resides within each one of us? Depending upon how you interpret the word spirit, we can understand this verse in two different ways. If this is talking about the Holy Spirit, and this is speaking of the fact that God's Holy Spirit uh, uh, um, yearns over us, watches over us, guards us with a, 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 a passionate zeal that cannot be measured uh, there, to the point um, uh, he is jealous for us. He jealously guards his own uh, because he loves them so much. And uh, so there is that sense in verse 5. And many Bible scholars choose to understand the verse that way, that God has given to us his Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit watches over us with an ardent zeal, with a passion that cannot be measured. But there is another way to understand this verse. Whenever I come across a challenging portion of scripture, uh, a scripture that is difficult to, to understand, one of the secrets I find to help me understand a difficult passage is to see it in its context. What has James been talking about here? He's been talking over the last several verses, the last couple chapters, about a wrong spirit. Describing uh, 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 the natural human spirit at its worst. The sinful nature. Now if we understand that James is one of the earliest books written in the New Testament, then Paul hasn't written his epistles yet. Paul hasn't developed the concept 
of the flesh to represent the sinful human nature. This might be James's way of trying to describe the, 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 the nature that dwells within each one of us, the sinful nature. That one that is filled with lusts and evil desires, that desire to have, that covetousness within us that's never quite fully satisfied. And here is saying that in verse 5, that the scriptures gives us ample warning against this kind of a spirit. But we need not fear, because verse 6 tells us there is a solution. Because God gives more grace. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. The solution to a sinful spirit is in letting God into our lives. Letting the Lord Jesus Christ come in and begin the work of transformation. God gives more grace. That is the hope. That is the help that we can have to overcome a wrong spirit and all the harm that it creates. Allowing God's grace to have its full sway, its full transforming effect in our lives. And so if you look at the rest of verse 6, by the way, if you're following on your outline, that's what the blank is there. The solution for wrong spirit, A, is the grace of God. And then secondly, the end of verse 6, God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble. Here James is quoting from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 34. The grace of God and a spirit of humility. These are the two things that James offers up here at the end of his discussion of the wrong spirit. This is what will counteract. This is what will work against. This is what will help us to overcome a wrong spirit in our lives. The grace of God and a spirit of humility. This is the key difference between these two spirits that James has been talking about. The spirit on the one hand that emphasizes self and the spirit on the other hand that is selfless because it is fully yielded over to God and to his spirit. One is consumed with self, the other is selfless in its motivations. And God, we are told, blesses the humble spirit. Drop down to verse 10 as James continues on with his thought. Humble yourselves, he says, in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Psalm 51 and verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite heart. A broken spirit, thou, O Lord, thou wilt not despise. Isaiah 57 and verse 15. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity and whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a humble and contrite spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. A message consistent throughout the scriptures. And this is what James is saying. Throughout the scriptures we are warned against allowing a wrong spirit to rise up within us and get the better of us. The way to overcome that is to allow God's Holy Spirit, to have its transforming effect upon our lives, to let the grace of God so overwhelm us that we are, uh, uh, and to, uh, to humble ourselves in the sight of God. So I suppose as we come to an end of our discussion tonight, we ought to examine our own hearts, to examine our attitude, our mindset, our way of thinking, our values. When it comes to making decisions, when it comes to reacting and responding to situations or to individuals that we face in life, what is, uh, how do we make that decision? Are our decisions, our responses based first on what appeals to our sense of self? Or what would please and honour the Lord most? May God give us the grace to serve him because God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. Just a few thoughts then on uh, uh, a challenging passage.
James, as we have un- come to understand in our study over the last uh, few months, minces no words. But he tells us like it is, and if we heed his instruction, the instruction of the Holy Spirit, then we can know God's blessing and help and strength in our lives.